Welcome to Fast Keto. I'm your host, Ketogenic Girl. Did you know that your body can actually be either a sugar burner or a fat burner? On this podcast, we talk all about how to make your body a fat-burning, fat-fueled machine and engaging your full metabolic flexibility. I'm Vanessa Spina. I am a sport nutrition specialist a biomedical science student at U of T, and I am the author of the best-selling cookbook, Keto Essentials, available on Amazon and creator of the Ketogenic Girl Challenge program. And I am obsessed with optimizing our health through all these different biohacks, ketogenesis, intermittent fasting, all of these amazing tools that center around making the body a fat-adapted, fat-fueled machine. With this in mind, I present interviews to you with biomedical scientists, physicians, and people from all around the world who have experienced remarkable results from following a low carb or ketogenic diet and getting their body into ketogenesis. So I hope you guys enjoy these interviews with this goal in mind. Welcome back to Fast Keto. I am so excited that you guys are here today. I am interviewing Sally Norton. She is the, I would say the world's preeminent expert on oxalates and she has been spreading awareness about oxalates for several years now since she first started studying them and finding out about them and she has helped me so much in my personal health journey in learning more about oxalates because I was on a very high oxalate diet being someone who was vegetarian and very interested in health and I was juicing and making smoothies out of kale and chard and spinach and berries and drinking tons and tons of nut milks, dark chocolate, all the high oxalate foods and I recently detoxed from oxalates. My body still is detoxifying from them, but her knowledge and information about oxalates really, really helped improve my health. And I have been so excited to get to interview Sally today. She is such a wealth of knowledge on oxalates and we delve into everything about them today, about how she came to learn about them, exactly what they are, how they act in the body, the foods that are highest in them, how to safely detox from them and so much more. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed getting to record it. You guys already know that I love easy ways to incorporate nutrient-dense foods into my diet, and I love anything that'll help hack my body to perform at its best. Now, one of the biggest secrets out there to transforming your body from the inside out, especially for those of us working to heal our guts or want to maintain a youthful appearance, is collagen. Collagen helps reset your digestive health and helps to heal symptoms of leaky gut. It keeps you satiated. A lot of people don't realize that bone broth actually ranks really high on the satiety index. So it helps to keep you feel full for longer and feel satisfied. It also supercharges your body with collagen, which helps heal your gut, but also provides beautiful skin hair and nails. One of the cool things is it keeps your blood sugar really stable because it has zero grams of carb and nine grams of protein per serving. Now, one of the cool ways to get more collagen in is drinking bone broth. When you first start out, it's actually common to do a one or two day bone broth fast to load your body up with all these nutrients even faster. But that's a lot of bone broth, up to eight cups per day. Now to make it really simple, it's important to find a product that's easy and convenient to use. And that's why I love this brand new product by F-Bomb. They just created a powdered bone broth. It's an instant, mess-free, and delicious way to get your daily dose of bone broth with all its collagen-rich, nutrient-dense goodness. All you have to do is you mix a scoop into hot water and voila, you've got a steaming mug of bone broth and no one will be able to tell that you didn't make it from scratch yourself. The powder is not some kind of fake bone broth. It's actually grass fed bone broth that's been dehydrated and fortified with electrolytes with zero grams of carb and nine grams of collagen per serving. It's really a must have for anyone who's doing keto, carnivore, or you're just interested in boosting your intake of collagen. 
They actually have two different flavors. They have a Cajun flavor for an extra kick if you like spice or savory beef for a more classic variety. Or better yet, you can grab a variety pack and try both of them. Now, right now they're running a very special offer for Fast Keto listeners. If you go to fatbomb.com and use the code FASTKETO, you will get 25% off your order. I really couldn't recommend this product more. It is so easy to use, so convenient. We all have busy lives and having this instant grass-fed bone broth full of collagen is amazing. And I think you're gonna love it as much as I do. So visit fatbomb.com and enter the code FASTKETO and get 25% off your order. And let me know how you like it. Welcome, Sally. Thank you so much for being here today on Fast Keto. I'm so thrilled that you could be here. It's fun to connect. Thanks for the invitation. Now, I'm so curious as to how you found your way into this world of oxalates and everything. But what I'm really curious about to first hear from you is did you ever think when you first started learning about oxalates that this whole world of questioning vegetables and fruits and the anti-nutrients in them would ever explode in this way? Well, I certainly didn't want to be an anti-plant food person. I, it never occurred to me that that was a path. Right. Uh, and that's the cool thing about the oxalate science is it is this fantastic opportunity to rethink and examine assumptions that we've just let carry through. And it's every assumption, whether fermentation makes things better or not, whether fermentation is an adequate way to make plants safer. There's so many questions about what makes a plant safe to eat. Mm -hmm. um, and we've really forgotten that because there's been a strange enthusiasm for phytonutrient science that's probably a product of the publisher parish pressure in science, in part anyway. Mm -hmm. Forget that you know you can't just take a walk in nature and start eating what's growing there. Most of the plants that surround us in nature are not edible at all. Yeah, that is that is very very true. And it, you know, it's so interesting learning about you know hunter gatherer societies and sort of how women. One of the reasons that women are such multitaskers, and we have this diffuse awareness, whereas men have more of a single focus women have this diffuse awareness. One of the reasons is so that we could go out and if we found a bush that had edible, safe berries, we could go back and share with the other women and other members of the tribe and say, you know, it's, it's this berry in that meadow, it's this bush with, you know, the leaves that are a little bit waxy looking in this shape. And we had to be able to describe this in order to pass on this information to other members of our tribe. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, we are the way we are, but you had to be so careful because you had no idea, you know, if you ate the wrong mushroom or the wrong plant, what could happen to you, right? Such an interesting point. I love these anthropological perspectives and that little vignette that you're describing of women also being incredibly verbal, like having yes. a broad, detailed vocabulary and being able to uh, pass verbal information on because of course we didn't have writing for most of human history and so the need to distinguish between a safe plant and an unsafe plant or a poisonous mushroom and one that won't kill you really required very high level verbal powers or some other form of symbolic communication that's cool that actually the need to navigate plants may have encouraged the development of language never heard that idea yeah, absolutely. I learned it um, from Alison Armstrong. She has um, she does incredible work studying uh, women and men and communication relationships, and you know how we've evolved those. But I, I use that skill now to help my husband navigate the grocery store when I'm not with him, and I can text him and tell him, you know, it's in the third aisle, not the one near the flowers, but the one here. And then it's, you know, the second row from the bottom and then to the left of the, you know, Caesar dressing. And we have this ability to recall those foods, whereas men have this single focus, you know, and they, they don't have that same diffuse, diffuse awareness. But 
Um, yeah, <laughs> it's like a context sensitivity you're talking about. Like we're aware of the whole scenario of the aisles and the whole big grocery store layout. Whereas the man is interested in checking the list, but let me get this. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so it's so so interesting. That is so great. fun. That yeah. is really cool. It really is a survival instinct, right? And I love how you bring that up because, you know, like you said, we know you can't just go out into the forest and just eat anything, especially some random berry or, you know, some colorful mushroom, and and know that you'll be okay with that, um, and yet vegetables and plants have been attributed this health halo for so long that you know you couldn't even question whether they might have you know molecules or components to them that might not be you know necessarily good for us although you know we know there's this hermetic effect you know in in many uh, compounds and vegetables um but it's it's been like that for a long time fruits and vegetables have been grouped together and to even question if a plant food vegetable might not be that healthy for you or might actually be detrimental to your health has been you know almost nutritional blasphemy for all these these years it's been incredible seeing all this questioning and like you said you know to your point to question things and to have a dialogue and not just sort of accept everything um as it's always been as you know, the way it is. So I, I'm so curious, how did you first find out about oxalates? Well, I'm grateful to my husband, who is a wizard with searching up Dr. Google, <laughs> who found for me the Volva Pain Foundation. I had a brief experience of intense genital pain that was muy distressing. Mm -hmm. And so it distressed the whole household. And he does his usual thing of running to the internet to answer all questions, especially questions of a medical nature. And he pulled up the Volva Pain Foundation. The Volva Pain Foundation. <laughs> I'm like, that's a double take right there. Who knew there was such a thing and that there was a need for such a thing? Because women don't talk about their genitals hurting. That's not done. So if this is a common problem, you'd never know it because mm -hmm. it's not a polite conversation. Mm. So that's shocking. And it was also shocking that it was so close to me. I worked probably about 45 minutes or an hour and lived and worked within about an hour of the location of the Volvo Pain Foundation, which was surprising to me. And also the work that I did was reaching out to the whole state where I lived in North Carolina in terms of um, bringing together the philosophies of holistic health and healing together with conventional medicine and making sure the two could communicate with each other and maybe expand our vision of how to promote good health from a public health perspective um, and from a perspective of how to train and raise conventional health providers so that they have wider vocabulary, a wider understanding of a more lifestyle oriented and holistic and a broader sense of there's more ways to promote health than suppressing symptoms with drugs and correcting mechanical problems with surgery. Um, so I was shocked that they existed. Anyway, I found out about Oxalate through the Volva Pain Foundation in 2009, and I attempted to learn that from them and validate what they were saying, but I was still working full time as a grant writer and I was in terrible condition with my own health at the time. My brain wasn't working very well and every brain cell I had needed to go to work. And I, I could not really make sense of this information because it wasn't seemingly scientifically validated. And my own experiments with changing my diet at the time, I, the vulva pain went away and that seemed like a minor problem in my life because I had so many other health problems, including this loss of my brain, the loss of my energy, tense fatigue I was having at the time, uh, bleeding uterine fibroids that uh, in combination with severe back pain it had me often kneeling during the day instead of sitting so I could sit at the desk or work at a desk for 45, 50 hours a week, half of the time kneeling so my back would get a break from sitting. Uh, <laughs> It, things were falling apart for me, so I didn't see the oxalate as really a prime thing. And, and, and experimenting with the diet, and I would go on and off sweet potatoes, which had become a great staple in my diet. 
because I couldn't tolerate the grains very well, especially wheat, and I didn't tolerate beans at all. So I was looking for starch, and I had developed sweet potato as a staple to replace, you know, cereals and potato and all that. So I would kind of go on and off sweet potatoes because I it just seemed like whatever oxalates are in sweet potatoes weren't bothering me. I could have my good, must be oxalates in other foods that were bothering me, not my sweet potatoes, because we were all reluctant to let go of our way of life, our favorite food. Our, <laughs> we don't really want to let go of our food friends. And I was the same way. And I, I couldn't see that when I went on and off sweet potatoes that I was immensely better when I was off of them versus on them. And that's because the Volvo Pain Foundation doesn't teach about the nature of symptom flares that happen after you stop eating oxalate foods. Your symptoms mm -hmm. can come up just as bad or sometimes worse after you stop eating high oxalate foods. And that's a whole can of worms that people need to learn and understand why that's happening in order to wrap their head around the fact that sometimes just observing your symptoms disappearing or not disappearing without this lens of understanding that the symptoms come back because your body's still full of oxalate because it's been accumulating over these many days, years of eating oxalate day in and day out. Right. And that's, I think that's one really major thing I wanted to talk about with you today is, you know, first of all, understanding where oxalates are and, and we'll cover that next, but also the management of detoxification is a little bit delicate and I think, you know, takes some knowledge and expertise. So I think that that's definitely something that will be really helpful for, for listeners to understand more about. So what exactly are oxalates? So oxalate is often said, as you said, in a plural form, because it's many forms of a chemical that can do all these different things. Oxalic acid is the base chemical. It's a two carbon molecule and two carbons is uber invisibly tiny. I mean, this is like water, you know, it's really tiny stuff. Oxalic acid being an acid, it's highly reactive and it, it has a negative charge on it that, that is attracted to positive charges and that a negative positive charge comes together to reform a, a new molecule that's called oxalate, which is a salt form of oxalic acid. That's the normal form in nature. Oxalic acid is really oxalate, the salt form. And it can, it can bond with any number of positively charged molecules, principally mineral molecules, but there are even other molecules that have negative charges. So the oxalic acid becomes potassium oxalate because that would be one of the minerals attached. That's a soluble form of oxalic acid or oxalate because the potassium and the oxalic acid will break apart under certain conditions in water. Mm -hmm. Same with sodium oxalate. So those are examples of the soluble oxalate molecules. And then other minerals bond so strongly with oxalate, they just love it. They're uh, minerals like calcium. Calcium oxalate mm -hmm. is this form that we see in nature most frequently that's easy to find both in plants and in our own bodies. Uh, calcium oxalate forms these crystals in the body, the most famous crystal of all being the kidney stone. Mm. So 80% of all kidney stones are built from calcium oxalate, but your doctor might tell you you have a calcium stone. In forget that the main substrate that builds that stone is oxalic acid or oxalate. Right. Can it, can it also, does it only bind with high affinity to, to positively charged ions or can it also bind to chloride or? Uh, you don't see a lot of chloride and chloride oxalate. No, it's good because it's oxalic acid drops the proton, which is the positive charge. There's always, that first proton is always dropped and because there's these two OH groups that right. can drop a proton. And that second one has a little bit stronger affinity to hang on and that allows it to bond with single charged positive ions. But typically in biology, it's going to drop that second proton and bond with something with a double positive charge like calcium. Right. That means and calcium oxalate is considered insoluble like that marriage between calcium and oxalate is 
undo it. You can't undo that. It's sort of quasi permanent. Although I suspect that the body has ways to uh, replace the oxalate with a different molecule and create a different form of calcification in the wake of, of an oxalate crystal getting trapped in a tissue and has clever ways in the cells that can generate enough acid through you know liposomal digestion and various metabolic tricks that it can do to start handling oxalate. But only cells that are super healthy can do it because working with oxalate is like working with something radioactive. It's pretty dangerous work and you have to be able to generate a lot of glutathione as a cell and have a lot of uh, nutritional and metabolic heft to be able to survive it. And I think mostly the worker cells that have to manage and move around oxalate die in the task, just like a Civil War soldier or a soldier anywhere would die in the task of saving the country or saving the peace in the land or saving the civilians, they die in the process of saving us. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes you get uh, fibrosis in the wake of oxalate accumulation in the body. If, it, if it's allowed to accumulate for too long, you get enough cellular damage that it, the cells get replaced with fibrotic tissue, which is scars. So you get scar junk, which is connective tissue that holds it all together. Thank God for connective tissue and scars because the scars are knitting your living cells together and keeping the cells, the tissues have some level of integrity and doesn't fall apart. But scar tissue doesn't have the metabolic functions that the real tissue would have. So it has the strongest bond or one of the stronger sort of bonds with the, the calcium. Right. That's probably the strongest one that you would see in our bodies is the calcium oxalate. But, you know, oxalic acid has been used for this ability to grab minerals in industry since the 1700s. We use it mm. in textiles and cleaning because that chelation uh, allows you to pull off contaminants out of materials. So you can clean all kinds of things, even your concrete deck. You can buy oxalic acid to take all the rust stains out of your concrete deck. Mm. Wow. <laughs> it's powerful. It's powerful stuff. Now, one, one of the, the things that's interesting about it, and I guess the irony of this is that it's found in some of the foods that we consider to be and uphold or maybe upheld as some of the healthiest foods that you can possibly eat, right? So the irony is really not lost on me that a lot of people who tend to be interested in health and health focused end up eating a lot of foods that are really high in oxalate. That would be me. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, I've been interested in health since I was like in kindergarten. I would run home and tell my mother, Mommy, we're supposed to eat this and that. And, you know, I really always thought it was a good idea to treat your body well and be vibrant and healthy and happy by eating right and listening to the authorities that teach us how to eat. Yeah, when I, I the first time I heard you speak about oxalate and, and oxalates, I think, was on a podcast with Jimmy Moore. Um, uh, maybe three or four years ago. And I was like, th these are all the foods that I eat. I mean, I eat so many of these because they're, you know, hailed to be some of the healthiest foods, spinach, kale, nut milks, berries, chocolate, you know, dark chocolate, tea. I'm like, you're basically just spelling out my diet. <laughs> So I had no idea that I was on such a high oxalate diet until I first heard you talk about it. And I was really, I mean, it's quite ironic that, you know, people who would be health focused and eating a lot of these foods would be, you know, getting the most exposure to them at the same time. Yes. And it's really concerning and it's terribly unfair because here we're making a big effort to be good kids and do what we're <laughs> supposed to do. Right. And then we're getting punished for it. Because it's based on, you know, a really narrow view of food. Yeah, so I was lucky enough that when I first heard you talk about this, it was the same time that I first started opening my mind to carnivore. I've been um, on a carnivore diet now myself since 
after doing keto for about five years, I got to my weight goal. I got to a lot of my health goals. I was feeling great. And the one thing that I did have a sort of a unresolved health issue for me was a lot of recurring urinary tract infections. And I didn't understand that there was a connection to oxalates. And it makes so much sense now that I understand more about them and especially kidney stone formation and the crystals. And when you look at, you know, when you see pictures of what oxalate crystals look like under a microscope, they're these like long spikes and, and crystals, right? So it was really interesting for me that that was what um, made me want to learn more about them. And also just hearing from, you know, you, how they were at really, really high. Like I was really eating a lot of the foods that were highest in oxalate, you know, so mm. obviously recognize there was probably some, you know, pretty heavy accumulation there over the years. And I only had full resolution of quite frequent uh, UTIs after completely detoxing from oxalates. And I also had crazy detox symptoms where I, I don't know if you, I know you hear from people what their different symptoms are, but for me, the last two things that I was still eating on carnivore was a hundred percent dark chocolate. And I still, you know, had coffee and tea. I know it's less in coffee, but really like tea and dark chocolate are some of the higher ones. Right. So, um, after removing those, the sides of my face and my salivary glands completely swelled up. Like they were maybe three or four times the size. And it was just, it was about, it lasted for about two weeks after removing the dark chocolate and the tea. It was so intense. Like I couldn't believe how much they swelled up on the side. And it would have been quite frightening if I didn't know, you know, what the reason for it was that there was this, you know, I guess you talk a lot about oxalate dumping. Yep. So <laughs> there's so much in what you're just saying there. I don't even know where to go because this yes. is really great. It's so nice that you're sharing this because I think having a real life situation helps to explain a lot for folks. And one thing, recurring kidney infections is very serious. I mean, it's usually a sign that you're getting some form of blockage because we tend to think that it's the flowing of the formating, forming urine and the, the excretion of the urine through urination that's helping to flush out any infectious agents that could accumulate there. So if mm -hmm. you're getting infection, you're getting clogging going on in the urinary tract. Mm. And before antibiotics, the main reason that you would die from kidney stones and kidney calcification was because you would get these infections and the infection would be what took you out. And that happened, and it happened a lot. It happened to a very famous man who was a, a fabulous uh, teacher in the 1850s. He was the international expert on urine analysis. And he talked about the oxalic di diathesis. He had this problem of recurring kidney stones and general health problems because of this related to this kidney stone problem. And he died at age 39 of secondary infection due to kidney stones. Mm. So the fact that if someone's getting recurring urinary infections, they need to take this very seriously because it's a sign of clogging. And the most likely clogging agent is calcium oxalate and the most likely source for that is your diet so you know that's really important and then that reluctance to let go of the dark chocolate and tea is kind of a good thing because what you had done there is you were allowing your system to um, not gain more oxalate you're probably eating enough so you weren't really adding to the overwhelm that occurs because we eat it at such high rates in our diets when we're trying to be healthy with our tea and our smoothies and our salads and our nut milks and our dark chocolate and all of that it's that's causing accumulation and if you cut most of it all out and got down to just the chocolate and tea you may have been down to something that's more what we call a maintenance dose 
So mm -hmm. by getting some on a regular basis, you prevented the body from releasing all the oxalate that's hanging around in your jaw and saliva gland and so on. But hopefully your kidneys were clearing up in the meantime, right? Because mm -hmm. you were doing less and less. So slowly in the background, your kidneys were painlessly getting better um, and you were getting less and less infection as a result of better functional performance. That better performance of the kidneys allows the blood levels of oxalate to come down because the kidneys are clearing it better and allows the body to recognize that it can clean up other areas as well. So you cut out chocolate and tea and got down to maybe almost no or certainly a low oxalate diet. Now the other tissues that are clogged beyond the kidneys are ready to clean up too. And it starts started with your face and your salivary glands. With me, it was my sinuses that was the first thing that went bananas. Like three mm -hmm. weeks after I started the diet in earnest the second time in 2013, my face developed like this facial migraine, which I truly believe was my sinuses clearing out oxalate that lasted about three weeks of really horrible face pain. It often was happening at night when I was trying to fall asleep because sleep time is the time when your body does healing and recovery and tissue repair. And if you get the toxins out of the way and you're nourished enough, the body will do tissue repair at night. And when you stop eating the chocolate and tea, your salivary glands were so ready to be cleaned out. All right. So I personally mostly avoid dairy on my keto and carnivore diet. And I've been doing that for several years. Dairy can actually cause a lot of weight loss stalls for people. It can cause inflammation in the body. It can be hard to not just eat a little bit of it. And I have found better success in weight loss personally in removing dairy, but I still use butter and I specifically use ghee. That's why I'm so excited about Vital Farms and their brand new ghee. They have been making pasture-raised butter for years and they believe that great ghee starts with better butter and that all starts with the cows, pasture-raised cows that are raised to graze on actual pastures like cows should be. Vital Farms Ghee is a clean and versatile butter oil for every culinary need. It is made by cooking butter down to remove the water and milk solids, which clarifies the butter. And that means it's lactose and casein free. My husband is also dairy intolerant. And so we are pretty much a dairy free household except for using ghee. Vital Farms Ghee has a high smoke point. It doesn't burn or chemically alter at high heats, making it great for frying and sauteing. Pasture raising ensures that its four-legged ladies are free to roam and forage open pastures on the American family farms they call home. This makes for contented cows, better butter, and now even greater ghee. Another great feature is that Vital Farms is the first ever ghee in a squeeze bottle and that makes the ghee even more convenient and ready to dispense. You don't even need a spoon to use it. If you are eating clean for the New Year, Vital Farms pasture-raised ghee is lactose, casein, and gluten-free, which equips you with the taste of butter and the functionality of being able to cook at a really high heat, which is perfect for sauteing low starch veggies or cooking your proteins and meats in. You can look for Vital Farms Ghee in the squeeze bottle exclusively at Whole Foods Market in Original and Himalayan Pink Salt. And you can visit vitalfarms.com slash ghee. That's vitalfarms.com slash G-H-E-E for a chance to win a year supply of Vital Farms Ghee for free. Vital Farms pasture-raised, BS-free. It was amazing. I mean, the amount that they swelled up, it almost looked like I had had my wisdom teeth taken out or something. And like a chipmunk face. Yeah. And it was just the this, this silver again. So I knew exactly, you know, their positioning in the, in the face. Anatomically, I knew exactly what it was that was swelling up. And the first time I did that, so that was in the spring and I went off the dark chocolate and tea for 10 days. And for 10 days I had the swelling and I'm on this trip. I was in Africa on this 
floating <laughs> hospital ship and it was like terrible timing. And I'm sure people were like, what is with her face? But I, you know, I, I was like, I was so determined, you know, to finally quit dark chocolate. And then we went to London after and I'm visiting all my friends. And finally I was like, I'm just going to have a little bit of dark chocolate and see what happens. So I had a little bit at night and I woke up the next morning, totally gone. Like my face was completely back to normal. Um, and it was, you know, ob- like literally overnight. And then I finally, uh, so six weeks ago now, quit it completely again. And this time I didn't have the swelling. So no swelling at all, no facial swelling at all. But when I, I was actually looking last night through photos <clears throat> of the last year and I had a lot of puffiness and swelling in my face and it is completely gone now after six weeks. So I'm a hundred percent, you know, carnivore as of six weeks, I, I cut out the, I cut out coffee, tea and the dark chocolate. And it, it was almost, there was almost a, a basal level of swelling in my face. I'm a pretty slim person, but it was always kind of there and it is all gone now. So I think I've removed all sources of it and I don't have any urinary tract infections anymore. I used to just think that that was normal, that you would just, it was part of being a a woman, you know, that you would just get these UTIs like three, four times a year and I would have to take antibiotics for them. And I just don't get them at Mm -hmm. all anymore. Um, I did experience some more, like I did experience some pain myself. Um, and I'm not sure if it was maybe some oxalate like kidney stones or crystals that was pretty painful. Um, and I added some, uh, baking soda to my electrolyte mix that I take and that resolved it pretty quickly. And I think there's something to do with maybe neutralizing some of the, the charged ions there. Yeah. So (laughs) That's a lot in that story. You know, the little bit of dark chocolate that you resumed after you got back from your Africa trip and were in London and then maintained just kind of a little bit of tea and chocolate in your diet was still keeping an inflammation process going on mm. by whatever mechanism. You know, it one additional explanation for it can be an allergy-like reaction to other chemicals in those foods because what happens with excessive oxalate in the body is The crystals of oxalate cause enough cellular damage that cells spill potassium, especially the cells that have a lot of potassium, like your Mm -hmm. muscles and bones. And that um, leakage and damage to cells is detected by the immune system. The immune system is patrolling for signs signs of damage and problems all the time. They're always on guard. And the oxalate does cause enough cellular damage and spilling of potassium that turns on the immune system. Now, this is the innate immune system. This is not learned immunity is stuff that you just already have the inflammasome and all of that where there's these um, chain metabolic reactions when there's something's detected it turns on these functions and these cells that turns on your immune system and it's chronic i mean if you're eating oxalate all the time or if you've got a, a oxalate accumulation problem in your jaw and saliva gland it's there all the time and it has the potential whenever it's moving around or causing any cellular damage to turn on the immune system. And I think a high oxalate diet encourages the development of autoimmune like symptoms and that you start developing greater reactivity to other foods and become more intolerant, more um, sensitive to foods where you get immune and inflammation reactions to other compounds as well. So it could be just the oxalate causing the inflammation, or it could be that your whole immune system is become super sensitized to plant chemicals of many kinds. Um, so there's that. The puffy face goes away. Isn't that lovely when you finally <laughs> feel like your jawbone exists and your cheekbones exist and your yeah. neck's not flabby anymore? <laughs> it's really I, great. And that, I think facial inflammation is a, a really um, another important sign is you should look for. I know with me, that's where I look the worst with all my inflammation and is in my face and neck. 
Well, people, and it ages you at my age, you know, yeah. in, in your mid fifties, when you have all that going on, you get this sort of saggy wrinkled look in this, as a woman, you totally are not into that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people keep asking me if I've lost weight recently, and I'm like, no, my face just isn't swollen anymore. Um, and it, it's amazing what a big difference it makes. Um, but I'm really curious. Now, I know for myself why I had so much oxalate accumulation. I mean, before going keto, you know, I was vegetarian for 17 years, and like I said, wow. All the oxalate foods were my diet, but I was juicing kale and spinach and, you know, chard and all the highest oxalate foods and just juicing them and drinking that. And, you know, I just was literally eating all the highest oxalate foods you could for so long because I thought they were the, the best ones for us. So I've personally had to do a lot to detox from that. Now, for the average person, would you say that that there are some people who are oxalate sensitive or is it sort of like gluten where some people are gluten sensitive, some people are less, but that there's always some underlying, you know, a damage being caused by oxalates or, you know, for the average person, what is that, you know, are oxalates, should everyone avoid all foods that have oxalates in them or what's your opinion on that okay so that's a really great question that everybody wants to know like okay i'm not oxalate affected i'm going to eat all my peanuts and potatoes and spinach all i want i'm fine is what everybody wants to have happen so you know we want total food freedom eat what you want but (laughs) unfortunately oxalate is just a poison it is a toxin and it's just a matter of tolerance like some of us now we can't tolerate it at all now that we're so our whole system is polluted with it. It got into our tissues and we're full of it. So therefore we are sick. We have a chronic illness of oxalate toxicity, which takes about 10 years to reverse. So you don't want to let yourself get to that point where you've been slowly accumulating it. And accumulation is a silent process. So you can't tell whether it's aging you and unless you're really paying attention to your osteoporosis numbers and your vascular health and your brain health and your urinary tract health you know if you've got deficits in those areas oxalate is a real problem uh, aggravator so even if your initial problems say in your urinary tract didn't have much to do with oxalate maybe it's some other damage maybe some other antibiotic or something that got you sensitized or some other pharmaceutical drugs because Almost all pharmaceutical drugs will damage your kidneys. And any damaged cell is prone to oxalate accumulation. So it could have started with lectins or drugs or antibiotics. And that set up tissues that are now more and more vulnerable to having oxalates get stuck in them and start causing additional problems and aggravating those problems and preventing the resolution of those problems. So it's not really a sensitivity it's a tolerance problem because when we use the word sensitivity, we're all, we're thinking like gluten. We're thinking like allergy is the, is, uh, am I allergic to it? You're not really allergic to it. Although oxalate can create more sensitivities. You are being damaged by it. And, and that is the definition of toxicity. Like it's a molecule that causes wear and tear and damage and prevents healthy functioning of cells. And so it should be in the same category as other toxins like mercury and lead and whether they come naturally or not is immaterial. It's the effects on your body. So depending on your philosophy about life and whether you just want to do whatever and die from whatever, some people want to do that. If others of us, those of us who've been eating all these healthy foods have been doing it because we wanted to be well for as long as possible live an old age where we're independent and free to do what we want and continue to enjoy our lives right up to the end. So if you're the kind of person who wants to have that active old age, then learning about oxalate and and moving away from high oxalate foods in your diet is a really smart move. Now, if someone wanted to sort of like keep in a couple of foods, like say they really like tea and like berries or something, would it, would 
does someone have to, you know, sort of go a hundred percent, you know, completely without all of the highest oxalate foods? Is that, or are there some ways to like, I don't know. Well, you know, as you noticed, you actually reduce the clearing symptoms by having a little chocolate, adding it back in. Mm -hmm. And that lowered that short-term symptom of your recovery process, but keeping it in maintain the puffy face. Mm -hmm. All right. So there's a benefit to keeping some oxalates around at a level of probably a hundred to 200 milligrams a day, which would be what the science believes we're all this eating 100 to 200 milligrams a day. That, that's what they're all telling themselves as they write these research papers. Like, oh, people only eat 150 a day. So, you know, this isn't a real issue. Unfortunately, uh, 150 is like three bites of spinach salad. <laughs> you know, so wow. depending on which food you're choosing and how high an oxalate it is and how much you're absorbing, which is one of the to major tolerance factors is how much gets in and that's your gut health if you've got any kind of SIBO uh, damage from glyphosate other kinds of uh, inflammatory conditions in the gut or you've just been eating oxalate so long you've got inflamed gut from the oxalate you're going to absorb more of the soluble oxalates and get them in so um, it depends on your particular picture what low enough is um, but going down gradually and maintaining some oxalate in the diet is often a good strategy so that you don't get into the big dramatic painful symptoms of a, a strong clearing reaction by the body which your big chip monkey painful salivary glands we're doing right mm -hmm. but at some point um most people ultimately feel better on as little oxalate as possible so if you're not feeling awesome not winning the race in life that you're running, then cutting back on oxalate gradually and wisely and supporting your body in the process of cleaning it up, you might as well get around to it now because it takes 10 years to do it. And uh, why do you say it takes 10 years? Is that just because it needs to be titrated down and done sort of slowly? Well, if you think about body maintenance and repair, and oxalate can get into any nook and cranny, but it's very prone to getting down into the bones because it's a huge sink for calcium. Um, mm. And the body sequestering and then wrapping up these deposits best it can to keep them from interacting with the tissues. So the body's holding on to them in a quiescent way that's not causing symptoms. Um, and so they're hiding out in these little packets down in scar tissue, down in places where you used to have infection or had an injury or had a break or hang around in your bones and tendons. You don't turn over your bones and tendon cells every day. It's not something the body generally does. It certainly doesn't go after the garbage unless it really is in a position to do so. It needs to be healthy enough. The kidneys need to be good enough. And hopefully your body is doing this kind of one bite at a time. If the body was to suddenly release all the oxalate in your tendons, bones, joints, glands, and jaw and teeth and sinuses and wherever, you would be so toxic, you would wreck your kidneys and you'd, you'd be on a list for a new kidney. You can't excrete all of that at one time. Mm. You just can't. And so there's a upper limit to kidney excretion and everyone seems to forget that. Like the kidneys are great at getting rid of oxalate, but it can do only so much work in a day. So you, it, it needs to be coming out gradually. And if you're lucky, your body will do it so gradually, you won't even notice it. You might in a year get a little pain in your finger and never think oxalates or get some trouble in your elbow for a few months or your hips start bothering you for a few months. You won't remember that it's because your body is clearing out oxalate that you ate 10 years ago, that you quit eating two years ago. So, you know, I see people who at first, their kidneys clear up and then two years later they get arthritis. And in most cases it's because now we're cleaning out the oxalate in the elbow or some other place. And the cells turn over I and mean, it takes like seven years. And it's the 10 year estimate comes from the fact that that's what people ahead of me are saying. You know, now that I've reached 10 years, I feel like I'm done. Um, I'm still personally, I've been doing this over six years now and I am still have lots of signs of oxalate clearing almost every day. I'm peeing out cloudy urine, which is the crystals in the urine. 
I'm getting bouts of fatigue or pain. I know that my hips were clearing out this week. That's kind of moved on. My back has been now clearing out. So it, it takes a while to get all this junk out. And people like you and I who are really into eating healthy and we're vegetarians and then, you know, relying on foods like tea, chocolate, or sweet potatoes, uh, we're, we're loaded with it. Yeah. I, I had, I had, um, last week really painful urination and cloudy urine, but I knew it wasn't a UTI because of everything I've been learning. Thanks to, to your work. I knew exactly what it was. Um, and I, like I said, I had some baking soda and I had a little bit of tea and it just like, you know, resolved it. Um, Whereas in the past, I would have immediately just thought, oh, it must be a UTI or, you know, I have to get antibiotics for it. So it's, it's, it's really wonderful to have so much knowledge and information that you've been sharing about it. Now, for someone who is learned, just new to learning about oxalates, what are some of the, the top, you know, sort of 10 foods or so that you tell people to avoid? And are there other plant foods that they can focus on that are low oxalate instead? I know you, you kind of build your plate around some of those. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to talk about foods, but I, I do think it's worth following up on what you were just saying to make sure that the listeners understand that you're, you're sending a signal to your body when you have the tea, which is oxalate, you're bringing in an oxalate dose that temporarily raises oxalate levels in the bloodstream and in the kidneys. And that tells the body, to stop the oxalate clearing that was causing your symptoms. Mm -hmm. So it calms it right down. So that whole uh, effort to clean up that area that was getting out of control and causing you symptoms and making you feel bad, you were able to send a signal by adding oxalate that turned it off. Mm -hmm. And nobody studied this. This is all happening in our individual lives, but there's no research that shows how this works and what the signal is and what, what's, Where's the communication going on in the body, which is fascinating, a really great area for some highly sophisticated research that may be really a tough nut to figure that out. But that's an important thing to know, that some people can use foods with oxalate to turn off some of these symptoms once they get really low in oxalate. And some people need to do it because they get into such trouble, they start getting into uh, chronic electrolyte problems, which causes anxiety attacks and arrhythmias and uh, racing heart and blood pressure spikes and all kinds of scary cardiac symptoms and, and, and neurological symptoms with the panic attack. So this, that whole thing is sort of confusing because people don't recognize this long-term chronic accumulation has to get undone uh, over the years. So yeah, the foods that got us in trouble you and me and all of us health nuts and could have, just been, could have just been potato chips. I mean, you could be buying either the junky ones or the healthy colored ones, but you know, yeah. potatoes, when you deep fry them, you just hold in all that soluble oxalate, which is the bioavailable stuff that gets into your bloodstream. You could be a potato chip. You could be a peanut butter fiend. So those are the sort of the foods that I consider the sort of not healthy people love to eat. And then those of us healthy people, we like to eat things like poppy seed bagels and sesame seed, this and that, and cashews and peanuts or uh, almonds, pine nuts on our fancy spinach salads. And we're going for the cool greens, which now Swiss chard is all hip because it comes in rainbow colors. And <laughs> spinach is everywhere because spinach is the green, somehow dark leafy green. Spinach became the poster child for that, is saving our lives. So, you know, I wasn't a spinach person. I was a Swiss chard person. But pick your green. It's really the three bad ones were the beet greens, the Swiss chard, and the spinach. Um, and most of us when we're trying to get healthy, we'll lean on one of those. Mm -hmm. And then there's things like, you know, the sweet potatoes, white potatoes, tomatoes. If, if you do concentrated tomato products, uh, carrots and celery. And in the fruit, the blackberry is one of the worst. The only one that's really worse, way worse is star fruit. But even tangelos and raspberries, the zest of your lemon, plantain, elderberries, figs, uh, Aju pear, the, there's a handful of fruits that are not so good. The beans in general, seeds and beans and grains, the whole grain, especially the bran and so on, 
are high in oxalate, so your whole grains, but then there's the pseudo grains. Some of the worst ones are buckwheat, uh, teff, and quinoa. Quinoa has made a big surge in mm -hmm. people's sense of if you eat Swiss chard and quinoa, you're going to live forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and dark chocolate is another superhero that just happens to taste great and be addictive and be a stimulant. And tea is still really popular um, and it's been promoted as a health food. Green tea, just as well as black tea, are both high in oxalate. And then there's some of the spices like black pepper and the poster child of a healthy spice is turmeric. Turmeric is crazy high in oxalate mm -hmm. and it's pretty bioavailable oxalate. But if you're taking curcumin extract, those are usually very low in oxalate. The processing separates out the oxalate from the curcumin, from the turmeric, the whole root turmeric. But the whole idea that you need uh, plants as these, quote, hermetic effects. Hermesis means stress, basically. If you, mm -hmm. if you cause some kind of difficulty for the body, the body will react. The body's competitive like that. It says, uh-uh, you're not going to kill me. Life is going to go on. And so the body reacts to these stressors, make you stronger and better, and heal you. So using plant toxins to stimulate healing only works at, at intermittent exposures at reasonable levels. You can overdo any kind of stress on the body. You could exercise yourself to death. You could dehydrate yourself and drop dead in, the, in wherever. You, you could use too much of any toxin, and it, it has the body can't respond with hermesis when it's dying. Right. <laughs> you know? And so you can't just say, well, it's hermetic, so eat whatever you want, however much you want in any frequency. That's just not scientific and not responsible. Absolutely. Now, of all the, the beverages, coffee has a lot less, right, than... Coffee is very low, very <laughs> low, very low. And it's very confusing because scientific literature keeps mentioning coffee as a high oxalate food. It's so frustrating. And that's why I wrote a blog post about the science behind the myth that coffee has oxalate. Generally, it doesn't unless you add mocha flavoring and chocolate, this or that to it. So I, I highly recommend anyone who cares about why has everyone got conflicting lists on the internet? Why are all these, I can't tell what's high oxalate and what isn't. Read the coffee post on my, in my blog area on my website to get a taste of how crummy the science can be. Yeah, that's, I think the methyl xanthines, the coffee, tea, and chocolate, they kind of get grouped together a lot, just like fruits and vegetables. But it's really interesting to me that coffee is, is so low. Now, why is it so high in tea? I'm curious. And are there any teas that are less, lesser offenders? Well, the herbal teas are almost all really low, even the ones that have okay. high oxalate ingredients, surprisingly. And that's a real curiosity that I don't think anybody has explained. I haven't seen any scientific study that explains why you can brew cinnamon and things into a tea and it's not very high in oxalate. And or why certain plants absorb a lot of oxalate, uh, like a tea plant. I I don't remember reading a particular botany study that explains tea's love of oxalate. But there, the botanists have described and proposed at least six or seven reasons why plants make oxalate, um, and it's for their own metabolic needs. They're, they want to protect themselves from too much calcium in the soil, so they use oxalic acid to sequester the calcium so it's not so toxic. They um, use calcium, they use oxalate to hold on to calcium as like a way to store it and create a calcium pantry so they can have it available in seeds at germination time. The calcium is needed cofactor to run the enzymes that help generate amino acids and turn a seed into a sprout. Uh, this, the leaves on some plants can take oxa oxalate and turn it into hydrogen peroxide and fight off fungal infection on the leaf. The, the full crystals are, uh, when they're, especially when they're in this rapide shape, which is a toothpick shape, the, the plant makes them in these vesicle wrap bundles of like 200 toothpicks that are pointed on both ends. And the plant literally shoots these toothpicks out as arrows in order to damage whoever's trying to eat it. So whether you're a bug 
or a human being, these little arrows are going to get you. Kiwi is a great one for having those rapide shaped kiwis, uh, rapide shaped oxalate crystals. Uh, and you'll see people complaining about kiwi online causing their, their mouth to burn a little bit. And that's because of those crystals there. It's really amazing. And if anyone is curious, if you look up or Google um, electron micrograph or electron um, photograph of the uh, electron microscope photograph of the oxalate crystals, it's really amazing how sharp and spear like they look. Um, and I, I understand now m sort of more why you have really dedicated so much of your career to studying this because in terms of all the anti-nutrients in plants, it really seems like if you're comparing it to lead and mercury, it, it must be really at the top sort of, sort of uh, the top li of the list when you look at all these different anti-nutrients that we're starting to learn about more that are in plants. Well, yeah, see, we have a long history of recognizing oxalate as a chemical since it was, you know, defined as a chemical in the 1700s. And so we've been hanging around oxalate both with industrial exposure, using it as a cleaner, people accidentally dying in the early 1800s of swallowing oxalic acid salts. They were called salts of lemon and uh, salts of sorrel because you use the sorrel plant to make oxalate. Uh, and it was called salts of lemon because people got in the habit of using a little pinch of the salts of sorrel to extend their lemonade because it could make the lemonade lemony and sour without needing a lot of lemons. So if you were short on lemons and had a big crowd, you could make cheap lemonade by throwing in a little oxalic acid. Um, and, and this salts of lemon was a standard household chemical that looks just like Epsom salts. So you would have your household servant go get your salts of sorrel to clean the floors with or whatever in the home and they go down to the pharmacy where both the counter person and the servant were illiterate and the crystals look just like epsom salts so then the lady of the house has a stomach ache and takes a spoonful of epsom salts and drops dead in two hours because it wasn't epsom salts it was salts of sorrel the cleaner wow and so that created a whole study of uh, this man who got a new job, the first one ever to hold this job, brilliant guy, and his partner, they put oxalic acid in the stomachs of various animals and watched the effects on the body based on changing the dose and so on. It's a fascinating study published in 1823. It was the first experimental study in toxicology, and it was done because salts of sorrel or oxalic acid is deadly. Um, so we've known that oxalate is deadly and we've been interacting with it as a cleaner and in our tea. That same culture that was dying of oxalate poisoning with their cleaner are the tea drinkers in, in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, and in England. And it was the tea drinking countries that see high levels of kidney stones and oxalate related problems. So our love of tea and chocolate came on in the 1600s. And ever since, I think it's been making the oxalate problem more obvious because it's enough a level that it, people get problems like what you've had with the kidney symptoms. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, I think cultures like the, um, you know, the, the great cultures of the past that were depending on whole grains would get arthritis and have osteoporosis and bad bones and die in pain. That's probably oxalate's a big reason why, plus the general malnutrition that occurs when you're living on grains. Um, so we're seeing, now we're entering an era where we've really upped the game and suddenly allowed high oxalate foods to be considered healthy mm. because we've just been ignoring the dietary aspect unnecessarily. The science is there. And as a public health person, I'm very frustrated that all these people were saying in the 1930s and 40s, you really have to watch oxalates in the diet in order to develop healthy bones and develop healthy babies. It's all there. And yet my field of public health and public health nutrition has not adopted that as standard knowledge that needs to continue to be moving forward. And we should be using that knowledge to filter through this enthusiasm for something in the green leaf that's supposedly so great. and yet 
it's not done in this context of, hey, there's also these other bad chemicals in plants. Well, I really have to commend you for all the work you've been doing to spread knowledge and information awareness about it because oxalates are talked about so much now and it, it really all is thanks to you and the work that you've been doing. So thank you so much for you know being so passionate about it and spreading knowledge and information. It really helped me and I know that it's helped and helping a lot of people and a lot of people who have gotten benefits from, you know, going closer and closer to zero carb or keto or carnivore have been getting a lot of health benefits because they've been reducing and removing their exposure to a lot of these foods. So, you know, I, I really thank you for everything that you've been doing to, to share and knowledge about it and spread awareness. Thank you for that acknowledgement. It's incredibly gratifying to hear that because when this happened to me, I thought, if I couldn't figure it out with all my knowledge and connections, there must be tens of thousands of people out there suffering like I was and they don't have a prayer because their doctor's not going to tell them and neither is their health guru who's pushing these foods. They're trapped in this big gulf between conventional medicine ignoring it and the enthusiasm now for health foods and these various healthy ideas in the ignorance, in this context of oxalate ignorance. I was like, I have to reach out and find people like me. Yeah. And it's so important too, because when people are ill, the last thing that they look at are the quote unquote healthy foods. You know, they just believe those are the foods making them better and stronger. So they would never even contemplate if those foods could be harming them in some ways. So that really underlies how important it is that you're raising awareness about this. And um, I think you said you were writing a book. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. So, and it, what uh, what can people sort of look out from you um, for, and and where can they find more on your sort of on your book and on any other projects that you're working on? Yes, I've been working on a, a PDF cookbook for my website, and I've been hesitant to put it up there. But it, we're we're here at the dawn of a new decade and the new year, and this is a great time for people to start fresh and I, I'm going to get that uh, available on my website if people need recipes and ideas for what the heck to eat and how to get through even get through the holidays. Um, so that's coming out. I'm working on this uh, book that is going to cover not only how to do the diet but the science as well and some of my discoveries in the library and help give people a little tour of what's already in the medical literature. Like if I give you a fast pass through five years of research in the library through this book so that it'll help you understand what's going on and help health professionals understand that this is based on science. So that, that book though uh, will take a while. That's how publishing works. And <laughs> we're just finalizing the contract now with Random House for the book. So that probably won't be out till spring of 2021, but that'll be here fast enough. In the meantime, my website has got a ton of free information on it and a bunch of stuff that's mostly free, too, in the shop page, as well as the regular pages and the blog. I, the blog is not a million uh, posts, but the posts that are there are all very informative and, and worth looking through to help get your mind around this because of, there isn't much support for recognizing oxalates are affecting your health. There's not support in your family life. There's not support from your doctor and so on. So I try to get enough information out there so that you know you're not crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if you were to put one thing on a billboard for the whole world to see, what would it say? Oh, maybe something like stop the veggie madness. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, that's great. Now, and I, I know you're also active on, on Instagram too. You have some great posts there and people can also see, I think some pictures of what the crystals look like and, and super interesting stuff. If people want to interact with you on social media, is that a good place to find you? Yeah, I, Instagram's a good place. I mean, I'm a little hot and cold with it because I, I am essentially a library geek and I'm still 
puzzling out. The oxalate is so cool. It presents so many puzzles and it connects to all the questions about how metabolism works and how cells work and what they need and how to support our cells in recovery from this assault of the oxalate. So sometimes uh, if I'm gone for a few days, it's because I'm busy resolving questions in science and helping clients. Uh, I have been working with people on a one-to-one -one basis, and I may be doing less and less of that so that I make sure that I get all these other projects done and start offering more opportunities for more and more people to interact with me and with each other. So be looking for that in 2020, hopefully some online support groups for both clients and for the uh, listening audience at large so that we can share information and stories and keep everybody moving forward in their health. That's wonderful. Well, Sally, thank you so much for being here today with all of us and sharing so much of your knowledge and expertise. It was really wonderful to get to speak with you, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for having me. It's really exciting to hear your story and puzzle that out together and connect with mm -hmm. you, and I um, appreciate, really appreciating you for sharing. Thank you. All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to the episode with Sally Norton today. It was such a genuine pleasure to have her on the show. I had such a wonderful time connecting with her and getting to speak all about oxalates. And I hope you enjoyed the episode too. And if you know anyone who you think might benefit from learning about oxalates, someone who has unresolved aches, pains, kidney stones, gout, or other symptoms, or eats a really high oxalate diet and has unresolved health issues send this episode over to them and share it with them and be sure to leave a comment over on instagram of what your takeaways were if you're listening to this episode i love to see where you're listening to it from and where you are and if you are interested in kicking off a brand new decade 2020 with a brand new you be sure to go check out the ketogenic girl challenge and have me as your coach and guide in navigating the keto diet to get to your health goals. I got to my dream weight, all of my fitness and health goals with keto by following a keto diet, following a ketogenic diet. I got to my health goals with keto, following it for several years, and I recently have been doing a higher protein approach to keto with a carnivore diet and I have learned so much about how to do keto properly. So if you've been doing it for a while, not seeing the results that you wanna see, try out the Ketogenic Girl Challenge with me. You can check it out at www.ketogenicgirl.com and I would love to have you join us and kick off 2020 with a bang. So until next episode, I hope that you have a wonderful, fat-fueled rest of your week. A few disclaimers. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice as I am not a qualified healthcare provider. The information presented on this podcast is for educational purposes only. Ketogenic Girl is not qualified to provide medical advice. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to this podcast. Prior to beginning a ketogenic diet, you should undergo a full health screening with your physician to confirm that a keto diet is suitable for you and to rule out any conditions or contraindications that may pose risks or that are incompatible with a ketogenic diet. A keto diet may or may not be appropriate for you if you have any kind of health condition, whether known to you or unknown, so you must consult your physician to find this out. Anyone under the age of 18 should consult with their physician and their parents or legal guardians.